Ladies and gentlemen, again, a warm welcome to you all for this wonderful evening. This is a thank you dinner for all the wonderful contributions that people have made and are hoping to still make for this wonderful kitchen project that is uh, our heart and soul of Melbourne Temple. We're known as the kitchen religion, and especially here in Melbourne. Uh, to start the proceedings off, I'd like to ask the Temple President, His Grace Aniruddha Prabhu, to give us an update as far as the progress of the kitchen project as it's happening, so you're all aware of where we're up to and how far we still have to go. So, uh, welcome everybody to our uh, thank you dinner and fundraising. Uh, 
I'd like to give you a little report on where we're up to so far. As you know, uh, our temple, is, uh, sorry, our kitchen is a well-worn community resource which is valued and patronised by thousands every week and probably including many of you. Um, we're currently distributing around about 5,250 meals every week. Uh, but our kitchen is sadly out of date. Actually, I don't think it, there was ever a time when it was really modern. <laughs> but it is now uh, tired and weary and just not big enough. Many, many reasons. We've got old and, and equipment that's not particularly efficient, takes a long time to cook things. Uh, it's uh, a strain to, if you, those of you who have volunteered and have worked in the kitchen, you know how much of a strain it is to carry a 90 litre pot of, full of boiling hot vegetables. It's very difficult to work with and almost a, it's, it's a strain on the health. So it's not user friendly. And it's, because it's out of date, then it, uh, it's not particularly efficient when it comes to using energy. Um, if you're boiling a pot of 90 litres of water, it takes ages to bring it to the boil. A lot of gas is being used and it's not terribly efficient. And because it's so small, we can't expand it. We can't expand our services. And um, this was probably true a little while ago, but you may not have been aware of this, but if we hadn't embarked upon this exercise, then the uh, city of Port Phillip would have closed us down as far as meal distribution. Right? So we had, to, we had to do this. We didn't really have a choice. Uh, we had no choice in pursuing a uh, efficient, um, safe kitchen that produced, produ will produce less waste, for example. So, we came up with a vision for a new kitchen and looking something like this, right? We, want to, we wanted to bring, or we want to bring Krishna's kitchen into the 21st century. So, uh, we've, we, we're introducing things Whoops, let me see here. Is my pointer working? No. Uh, so much for that. We want to introduce friars. At the bottom of the picture here, that's a fryer. Uh, steam kettles. Next to that, there's, we've got in this picture a couple of steam kettles. Um, the steam kettle that we've, we've actually got installed, I'll show it to you later, can cook. 100 litres of sweet rice, unattended. It's got its own stirrer and a timer. So when you know what temperature to set it at, how long it needs to be stirred, and the speed at which the stirrer should stir, you can sit and forget your sweet rice. Very high tech. I'm not sure how much devotion is in that sweet rice necessarily but it's practical. And next to the steam kettles, we've got brat pans, which are basically the equivalent of your pots. And at the end of that, right at the end, we've got what's called a combi oven, which can steam, which can bake, do a combination of, the, of both, and very, very quickly can cook ve vegetables uh, in a matter of 15 minutes or so, whereas when you're boiling a pot of water, putting the vegetables in, that can take up to half an hour. 
These, this equipment can cut the time of cooking in half. So, with this new vision, we can increase our output. And this is achievable, perhaps not with the current setup, but our goal is to open up more crossways and, and more uh, go pales and the, the facility that we're building can service those new facilities and that way we can increase our distribution. So we could notionally be distributing up to $1.1 million a year and we can then be fulfilling Silla Prabhupada's order that let every hungry man of Melbourne come and eat. So this was our this is this is our goal, and we're well on the way to achieving this. Um, we decided it would be part of our offering to Srila Prabhupada in the last year's uh, 50th anniversary celebrations of um, of the society. We'll we'll have a more dynamic uh, ISKCON in terms of more restaurants and more meals distributed and. You know, they say the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. And I think it's the same for women too, isn't it? Uh, um, so more meals means more people touched by Krishna, touched by the devotees. And it, it, that means we're, we're making more friends. And, and uh, we want to... We want to uh, we want to influence. We want to have some influence in society, and this is one of the the most uh, practical and uh, uh, friendly ways of making one's presence felt. It also, for our community, it will mean that we have a stronger foundation, economic especially. Opening up more restaurants means basically more money. For the society, it means jobs, employment for our members. And as I said, it helps us I I increase our reputation and our influence. Um, we've got savings and efficiency. Uh, we'll probably use more electricity, but one of the things, I don't know if you've noticed in your visits to the temple, but we've installed a solar array on the temple building and on the kitchen building. So we're actually going to be generating as much electricity from that solar array as we are currently using at the moment, or very close to it. Uh, but the kitchen will certainly, if we're cooking more meals, um, it doesn't mean that, it, it will be using it more efficiently, but that, because we're increasing our cooking, we'll naturally increase our costs, but it'll be more efficient. Uh, quicker to cook, less effort for the cooks, and for those of us who are managing the finances, less wages. And for the workers, uh, we'll need less cooks, but they'll be working in a safer environment, and we'll produce better quality prasadam. So that's our. That's that's the that's the. Um, they're our goals, if you like, the problem and, and the solution to the problem. Um, I happened to sneak into the kitchen this afternoon and took some pictures. So um, this is, I tried to take a picture the other way around, but anyway, this is a reverse of that image. Uh, whoops. Okay, there's the bins. Those of you who are familiar with the kitchen, you're, you're familiar with the blue plastic tubs, right? Where all the bogus kept in? Well, these are their replacements. Far more efficient, cleaner, and uh, very attractive. For those of you who like looking at pictures of kitchens, this is kind of like kitchen heaven, right? Uh, this is on the other side. Big. You can see the uh, extractors that will be taking the exhaust out of the kitchen. 
a big oven there with a, a very heavy duty range on top, a fryer next to that, and two brat pans. And well, that's, that's another oven there, isn't it, Prabhu? Yeah, there's another oven there. Okay, some benches for the cooks to get their preparations together. This is a dedicated vegetable cut-up area. That, see where the top of that sink is there, that lip, that goes all the way down to the bottom. You could, you could have a swim in there. If, so that's for preparing potatoes and carrot, you know, the sabji. And that whole area there is just dedicated for cutting up and uh, prep. This is the, this is the cake uh, prep area, sweets fully dedicated just for making sweets. Um, that's a turbo fan oven. You can also cook pizza. You can also cook pizza in there if you, if you wanted to. So um, this kitchen, in two or three weeks, we'll be testing the equipment um, in order to, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's more sophisticated equipment, so we will need to train everybody how to use it and um, uh, so there's a fair bit of work to be done in testing it, getting it running, and then the, the, the people who have provided the equipment have told us that they'll provide us as much training as we need to get everybody up to speed. Okay, so here's the nitty gritty of things. Um, the total cost of this kitchen, and that includes the refurbishment of the Didi kitchen as well. So as soon as we get the new kitchen running, then the, the deity kitchen, or the, what's now the main kitchen, and the deity kitchen will all be stripped. That, those rooms will be completely gutted, and then we'll, re, we'll be rebuilding a new deity kitchen and a, and a guest kitchen, and a storage for guests' plates and, and a, a, and a uh, dishwasher. We're going to go away from using paper plates, which are very expensive and create a lot of waste. We'll, pre we'll be putting in, uh, in place 500, 600 stainless steel plates with a storage facility and with a dishwasher. We'll, we'll spend more money on water, obviously, but um, it'll be cheaper for us because we won't be buying so many plates, paper plates. So, uh, all of that, completing all of that, is going to cost us about $2.2 million. Wow. Thus far, we've raised one point, that's close to $1.9 million, right, from our members. And for that, we're, we're well, it's not all that we, we need to thank the Victorian government, who have given us very generously uh, $500,000, which is significant. Yes. In fact, it seems they had more faith in us than many of our members <laughs> because they gave the $500,000 first. And that then uh, has really uh, spearheaded the whole project. And of course, uh, we've then raised, well, we, we took a loan from Westpac, $500,000. And uh, so what's that, 1.3, we've, we've raised about $800,000 from our members. We've spent nearly 1.8 million and we've got some money in the bank and pledges coming in. Current pledges sit at 400,000. But here's the sticky point at this point, whilst we've got pledges coming in regularly, we need to pay for everything right now. So we need basically about $400,000 to complete the work that we've, we've started and almost finished, very close to finishing. All we need to do now is finish off the, the, the new DD kitchen, the new guest kitchen and that plate storage area that I mentioned. So um, we're... Uh, indebted to and very gratefully uh, um, we're very grateful to those of you who have already contributed to this project 
Um, uh, but would you know it, we need some more. Um, we're looking for $400,000 between now and the end of August, basically. Uh, that will cover the cost of everything. And of course, the funds that we've got coming up, pledged, that will help us then move forward because we're going to move the Prashadam Hall down to where the theatre is and refurbish the theatre, which is now the Prashadam Hall. So we've still got, we've still got um, things to do. But main focus at this point is finish off the phase, the, the first phase, which is uh, complete the kitchen. And so what funds we've got pledged later, uh, after completion of this phase, we'll use those funds to move into the second and third phases. phases. So, we need your help. Again. <laughs> Or always, huh? this is the nature, the nature of devotional service, that it is um, eternal, right? nitya, no stopping, or anitya, doesn't stop. We want to increase our capacity, we want to help the cooks, we want to make things run more efficiently, we want to feed the hungry of Melbourne, we want to purify the, our uh, fellow Melbourneites with Krishna Prashadam, sanctified food and uh, um, we need, need your assistance um, we do plan to open up another restaurant later on this year uh, which will assist us in um, keeping our commitments to the bank and, and uh, to maintain more devotees. So we're, we do have plans to open up another restaurant. But at this stage, we really do need some extra support now to reach that 400,000 target. So here's what we'd like you to do. We'd like you to contribute yourself, tell your friends, get them involved. Um, it shouldn't be that difficult to um, raise those funds. So anybody who's inclined to make a pledge, we've placed pledge forms on each of the tables. Uh, while we're having our Prashadam, a number of our member services team will be going to the tables and inquiring from you or collecting from you your pledges. Um, for those who've already given, thank you very much. We really have, um, we're, we're almost finished. Something which for me was a dream of, this has been a dream of, what, 30 years nearly, at least. And it's, uh, it's very satisfying and, and very um, almost overwhelming uh, to, uh, realise that we're very close to um, completing the, the kitchen project and it's going to have a major impact on, on what we do. So uh, thank you very much for those who have already contributed. Thank you for, to those who are uh, considering and will support us in the future. Um, Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So now we're in the picture as to where we stand as far as the kitchen is concerned. Ani Ruta Prabhu, thank you very much. Um, we have a message from uh, the current opposition leader, uh, Mr. Matthew Guy, the Honourable Matthew Guy, who wanted to be here tonight, but apparently he's celebrating his 10th anniversary of marriage and has gone away with his wife for the weekend, so he couldn't attend. But we have a couple of people here that are members of his, his opposition, the Shadow Cabinet. Unfortunately, we couldn't get anybody from the government to come on short notice, which is a, an apology. Martin Foley would have liked to have come, but again, there was uh, just not enough time. But in a sense, we also owe a lot to the 
uh, the Liberal government who were the ones that actually granted us this opportunity of having the 500,000. So it was the Naphthone government that actually allowed us the opportunity to get started on this huge project. Uh, on behalf of uh, that government that supported us in this way, I would like to call first on Margaret Fitzherbert if she would like to come up and say a few words. Margaret was here when we had the fire jugger, the groundbreaking ceremony. And uh, Margaret is, is a wonderful lady who is a shadow parliamentary secretary for the Women's Health and Rural Regional Health and member of the Southern Metropolitan Region and has been a great supporter of this project. Margaret, I've got a lovely garland for you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I will speak only briefly to this large, very happy grouping today. Um, it was terrific to be there when the ground was broken uh, for the development, and it's even better to be here tonight to celebrate the dream almost becoming a reality, very, very close to it. There's a huge amount to celebrate, um, particularly when we hear that this is a dream that some people have had for 30 years, a very long time. Um, as was mentioned, Matthew Guy is unfortunately unable to be here. He certainly owes his wife a weekend away, given the hours he's been working lately on this special anniversary. And I also want to um, mention Craig Ondaatje, who was a great friend um, of this community um, and who in fact was the one who first introduced me. He said, this is an extraordinary place and you must get to know it. I was so glad that he made the introduction. So I simply want to say congratulations. It's wonderful to see the funding that was granted several years ago now, I think, um, being put to such good use. And I look forward to seeing um, the kitchen when it's open and operating. Um, I'm sure I'll receive an invitation uh, to your you know, famous hospitality when that happens. So congratulations and thank you. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, another great friend of the movement uh, who said that he would pop in, and he still may pop in with his wife, Robin, is the former Premier of Victoria, Ted Bailey. We all know Ted. He loves coming for Janmashtami. He loves playing the Madunga. He loves chanting Hare Krishna. And uh, he said he would pop in. He did have another engagement. So if you see another man as tall as me coming through, then you know Ted is here. And I'm sure he'll say a few words as well. So again, we have to thank Ted a lot because actually he was instrumental in convincing the Naphthine government to actually support this project. He was the one that pushed the buttons because he loved the devotees so much when he experienced our hospitality at Janmashtami. So hopefully Ted will come. Uh, another dear friend that said he would pop in, but he had two marriages to perform, and he still may pop in. You never know with Father Bob. Father Bob is our comrade in arms. Uh, he serves the hungry of Melbourne just as we serve the hungry of Melbourne. We join together in different projects where we provide meals for his crew, for his team of people, and distribute meals right throughout Melbourne. He very much wanted to be here tonight, so I don't know where he is. <laughs> uh, hopefully he will come later on. If he does come, you'll certainly hear about it. He, you'll, he'll make himself known. But anyway, we really appreciate Father Bob. Uh, I would like to now also ask another member of that government that has first supported us, Inga Pulic, who is a member for the Victorian Parliament in the Legislative Council. She's the Shadow Minister for Multicultural Affairs and the Shadow Minister for Scrutiny of Government. Keep the bastards honest. <laughs> and also, we, we bump into each other every time there is an interfaith program. Inga and I have become very good friends over the years because she is adamant about working with people of other faiths. She's sincere and uh, I really respect her, just as I respect both Margaret and Craig on Dunchy. You know, we hear a lot about politicians that leave a lot to be desired, 
but these people that I've met, they are genuinely concerned for the welfare of their constituents and the people of Melbourne. And I praise you, and Inga, if you'd like to please come up and say a few words. Thank you. And a beautiful garland it is. Thank you so much for honouring me. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to join all the members and devotees and uh, Bagdasha, who's been a, a good friend and has uh, uh, been a very significant pres um, presence in a number of those uh, faith community events, uh, in particular many of the Hindu events that, that uh, you've also attended. I'd also like to acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, Margaret Fitzherbert, and uh, I've been enjoying the PowerPoint. And thank you for being able to attend that groundbreaking event that I regrettably wasn't able to attend at the time. Uh, but um, uh, I'm delighted to be able to join you here tonight uh, in celebration of, uh, uh, of what you've achieved, but also looking forward to uh, completing this project, but also looking at future activities of your temple. Could I also acknowledge a very important person in the multicultural um, uh, space, and that's Hakan Akiol, who was previously uh, very much the key, the, the, the go-to person when it came to applications for grants at the Office of Multicultural Affairs, and he will again in the future be the go-to person. Uh, he's uh, aware of all of the details of the project and tells me he's fully aware of your future plans. Now, I'm not. I certainly look forward to being briefed and receiving a copy of that PowerPoint um, as well. I, I was just saying earlier, I know your temple very well. I used to live around the corner in Kerford Road. As a little girl, we used to climb the fence and play round us in the grounds of your temple. <laughs> very, 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 very warm memories of that place. Uh, and certainly it's changed dramatically and uh, clearly improved. And I'm, I'm delighted that Ted Bailey saw the need to invest and commit to a grant to help you kick along this very important project. Feeding the homeless, is there any worthier cause than that? Uh, especially in, in this day when there's so much dislocation, so much isolation, hidden unemployment, uh, m people who suffer from mental health and substance abuse issues who need uh, a helping hand. And you're right, uh, the best way to a person's stomach uh, is through his or her, uh, the, the, the heart is through, through his or her stomach. And I, I say that as the daughter of a chef. We actually had a restaurant, so I'm, I'm very astute when it comes to judging the adequacy of kitchens. And could I say that is impressive? It is a very, very impressive setup. And uh, my, the, the t my mother is now 83 years of age, so, so she no longer obviously has the energy and the stamina to cook as much as she used to, although the, the children and the grandchildren still um, yearn for her magnificent cooking. And um, when, when, when she does prepare a, a family meal, if they like it, they say, Nana, you cooked this with love. The sign of a good, good meal is when it's cooked with love. And uh, I noted also the comments about how to cook the rice. I've got this terrible habit of stepping away from the kitchen stove when things are being cooked, and guess what? I come back and they're burned. So, so a very important lesson that my mother taught me is never move away from the stove. But of course, that was before much of the automation that has occurred. I know you've got some problems. You've got some problems with electricity. It's very hard to cook when you don't have electricity. So I hope that you overcome that burden. And no doubt, with the support and the, of such, a, such an active and devoted community, you will reach your goal. Um, I'm, uh, I regret the fact that uh, Father Bob isn't here. I'm sure he would have uh, livened up this occasion further. And certainly I know that Ted Bailey thought very, very highly of your temple and all that you uh, aspire to achieve. And I'm sure that if he doesn't have a chance to be here tonight, that uh, he would wish you all the very best of luck and have a, sm have a smile uh, on his face for actually being a part of that uh, project. In terms of Matthew Guy, Margaret has already passed on his apologies. Uh, as the former Minister for Multicultural Affairs, he knows how important it is for governments to actually put um, their money where their mouth is. And although we can't put money into the building of religious infrastructure, 
we can put money into uh, the development of community facilities that are associated with uh, various religious institutions. And so whether it's community halls, whether it's a commercial kitchen, whether it's um, other types of work uh, rooms for delivery of services and classes, that's the sort of projects that we can support. Of course, being a, a, a migrant myself by birth, I came here from a communist country where religion was not allowed. Uh, indeed, it was punished. It was, it was, I was baptised in secret at the age of eight. Uh, so for me, religious freedom is very, very important. And we are indeed very lucky to live in a country where we can uh, freely practise our religion within the confines of our law. And uh, I'm a great advocate of multiculturalism, but you know what? Without religious freedom, we don't have multiculturalism either. So it is very important that you continue celebrating your traditions, that you continue to do the good work of helping those who are isolated, those who are homeless, those who need guidance and salvation. I commend you on your work and I commend you on your project. Thank you so much and thank you for the opportunity of joining you. And guess who's just arrived? Right on time. Our dear friend, our comrade in arms in helping the poor of Melbourne, a hero of Melbourne, a legend within Australia, it's Father Bob Maguire. <laughs> Bob, come up. Can you manage? Thank you, because we had a devotee, one of ours, in um, Sydney. Did you tell him that? Yeah. Brian oh, yes. Rudd, must say that. Yeah. Um, who came to us oh, in the beginning. He was, he was the first devotee of, of my outfit, whatever it was called, whether it was called Roman Catholicism or something. But I think we ended up calling it Open Family in the beginning, which confused the bishop, which so it shouldn't, should it? Because any religious worth its salt is in fact an open family, isn't it? Which is why we've, look at this for heaven's sake, look what you've done. You see, you've done it. But he was with us for a long time and he moved in and out of the, the dark side of society and back into the light and back into the, so he didn't stay on the dark side but he was in care for 18 years, a ward of state. It's a long time. In fact, the experts are saying now that anybody who's been in care since infancy is entitled to lifelong support because they will be suffering from post-trauma stress disorder which I know, I understand, the labels are, are, are good, but the fact of the matter is, somebody's got to do something practical, whatever the label is. And uh, after he got out of uh, care, so to speak, he wandered around for about 20 years, which took him to about 2040, and then he left Melbourne because the dark side was always beckoning, as you know, start with small with drug trafficking on a small scale and before long you've joined in with the with the big boys see what i mean so he left before it got him and he went to sydney to martin place especially martin place and he started shoe shining as a little uh, pop-up job and he his, his his natural talents came out because he was a showman and he used to talk to everybody who were having their shoes polished. And a lot of people made friends with Brian. Brian eventually died from natural causes after a lifetime, a lifetime of drug abuse and the rest of it caught up with him and eventually he died, but natural causes at the age of about uh, 60. And lo and behold, he had expressed to me that he wanted to be buried, his ashes to be scattered in, in the Ganges. So years ago, and I said, what the, 
Because you know what us Australians are like, for heaven's sake, I mean, scattering ashes in the Ganges. The MCG may be, <laughs> but the Ganges, why? And apparently, you see, because he was in the public uh, thing, polishing shoes, and you lot were there too. You see, good old Hari was there, and he was attracted to Hari because of the peace, joy, and happiness, which is a tremendous uh, contribution to make to Australian society. Peace, joy, and happiness. So when he did die, eventually, a, another mob called uh, the Shane, what is it? Not Warren, is it? War, W-A-U-G-H, Shane War Foundation that does work in India for, the, for disadvantaged persons. They offered to uh, attend to his <coughs> cremation and they would take the ashes on their next trip to India, which was the Aussie's fatal trip to the tests. Uh, they might have thought Brian Rudd's ashes might have helped them. But they didn't. So they then uh, got the good services of one of the uh, holy men at the river and scattered his ashes. And then some of the ash was sent back to us in Melbourne. We had a little service of our own for what he remains of his um, uh, family, brothers, sisters and so on. So I thought at the time, that you've got words for this. Uh, in English, I think it's called serendipity. What's it called? Karma. That's it. An example, see, of it. I said, before me eyes, for God's sake. And once you've been to the top of the mountain and seen the promised land, nobody can convince you that you didn't see it. <laughs> isn't it? Which is why His Holiness is over there. Isn't it? Because he went to the top of the mountain and saw the promised land. And where the uh, beneficiaries of his journey, and I'm one of the beneficiaries of Brian Rudd's journey, and I'd like to thank uh, Hare Krishna for the contribution they made um, through random acts of kindness, which in fact were spiritual gestures that Brian Rudd, who was the first man to come to us looking for some assistance as an outsider in the Australian society. He, he, he ne would never become one of the elites. He would become one of the delites. Dalits, is it? One of the untouchables in Australian society. So um, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you to you, sir, and to the Hare Krishna uh, people for um, looking after one of mine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. Now, there's one person that I still have to thank. And I asked him if he would like to say a few words. But Harkin is a very shy man. And uh, he said, no, I'm not going to come up. <laughs> but we'd like to acknowledge you anyway. Harkin Akhol is and was, he headed up the multicultural affairs, as Inga was saying, and social, well at the moment he heads up the multicultural affairs and social cohesion division of the Department of Premier and Cabinet. Harkin was the first person we approached and asked for funding for this project when he was director of OMAC. And he was a great supporter right from the very start. He came to the temple, saw that what we wanted to do, and was totally supported and committed right the way through. Harkin, I appreciate everything that you've done for us. Thank you so much. I won't ask you to speak if you don't want to speak. Can you please give Harkin a garland of appreciation? Thank you very much, Harkin. So that's all the formalities now, and now we're going to get into this lovely feast, the thank you dinner. Now while the prashadam is going on, and while you're filling out your forms for contribution, we've got a wonderful band that's going to be performing for you. They are called Soul Brother. 
They are a new band, they're a Hare Krishna band, they sing contemporary songs focused on spiritual subject matter. Also after them, again during the meal, we have Vishuddha Priya Mataji, she's going to be doing some wonderful bhajans. So you've got the contemporary music and you also have the more traditional bhajans. So again, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your contributions from the past and thank you for your contributions tonight. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, thank you very much.
achieved tonight is $100,495. So we've got a little way to go, but that was really fantastic. Thank you all very much for your contributions. Uh, we look forward to serving you from our new kitchen facility in the very near future. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to the Guru Parampara, and thank you very much for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hare Krishna!